write the people that scare us the most in society, because I think if we can really start to understand why they scare us and what they represent and see their humanity, then we can have a more nuanced understanding of ourselves and each other and the world that we live in. I wrote this play specifically for an American audience to root for an immigrant to cross the border illegally by the end of the play. The Ghost of Lote Bravo is about what people will do to survive and to protect their families. I had a fellowship at Juilliard. This was the very first play that I wrote for that, for that fellowship. And it was selected for the NNPN Kennedy Center MFA Play Workshop. And from there, Borderlands and the Unicorn decided that they were going to do a production of the play. A rolling World premiere for me is really a huge stepping stone in my career. It means that Really, for the first time, my plays are getting real productions and real visibility in a way that they haven't before. It's very exciting to be part of the Rolling World premiere. I think that, you know, you're working on a national level. You know that the playwright is coming through and taking notes and uh, almost always, you know, makes revisions between the first and second, and even the second and third productions. Sometimes we think, you know, we're an island. We're the only theater that wants to find playwrights or playwrights of color or female playwrights or young playwrights. You get together with these other theaters in the NNPN and it's like, wow, they're all looking to do this. Right now I'm in rehearsal, <laughs> two rehearsals at the same time at Borderlands Theater in Tucson, Arizona and the Unicorn Theater in Kansas City. So I've been flying back to back, going from one city to another city, one city to another city. Um, it's, it's a bit overwhelming, <laughs> if I'm gonna be totally honest. It's a lot to juggle two completely different casts, two completely different interpretations of the script, uh, just being in the dynamics of two very different theaters that operate in very different ways um, and have very different budgets for the play and sort of trying to figure out how to try to give them as much of a roadmap for this play as possible in a very, very, very short amount of time. We don't own our own theater. Uh, we're a very small company. And so part of working outside, I mean, we are in the desert. It's not the same desert as Lote Bravo, but it's still uh, very similar. Uh, and so I think it's, it's uh, helping actors to get a little more experiential feeling. And then, you know, there's a, there's a gate right here. And sometimes people walk through and they stop and see us working. Borderlands Theatre has, has a long history of doing plays that have a historical background or a documentary background of current or historical issues in our community. Hilary Bettis has done a, a thorough job of investigating the complex reality of these border residents in a way you will not read on the front page of a U.S. newspaper. A couple of years ago, I heard an interview with a photojournalist who had documented Juarez since the early 60s and talked about the change in the city and, and the city going from sort of this quiet, um, suburban, middle class, very, you know, tourist town to this city riddled with um, extreme violence and extreme poverty, and it was almost overnight. One of the things that he talked about was the murders of women on the border and that a lot of these bodies were dumped in Lote Bravo and nobody had ever been arrested for these crimes. They were literally getting away with murder, with impunity. That kind of led this like obsessive desire to understand what the circumstances of these people's lives were. 
I really believe that what's happening on the border is one of the greatest human rights atrocities of our generation and that these people are refugees that are fleeing violence uh, that's been caused by NAFTA and the way that we, we, we want cheap goods but we don't want to pay people for that. There are many things that are attractive about the play, but really what for me was more relevant the first time that I read it was that these women are working women within the maquilas. And in that space, in one of the largest free uh, trade zones in the entire world, they are being constructed as cheap labor and disposable within the system, which really makes them more disposable also outside. And there is that conflict that is at the center of this piece. We need to pay attention, and it's what she's doing, to the fact that neoliberal processes are interacting with patriarchal structures, gender ideologies, and colonial histories in these areas where the global south and the global north meet. She's like laying out the facts. This is how powerful I am. I know the truth to everything. I know the entire like trajectory of this bottle of tequila, this all of the blood on this hand, this money that has blood of all of these people on it. She's bringing the story, she's bringing this bottle full circle again back to like her hypocrisy and her complacency in this system. I think what's really interesting about doing this play in Tucson, Arizona specifically is that this is a, a, a town that is really extremely politically active in issues happening on the border and this is a story that really is about their own backyard. Everyone that's in this um, production cares about border issues. Everyone here knows the message and has something to say. I'm an immigrant. Um, I grew up um, undocumented in this country um, and the wait to actually even sit before an immigration officer was 15 years. And then when it became my turn to, to become a, a legal resident, then, then everything changed because at that point, it's like I could become legitimate and, and not fear that something was gonna go wrong and, and I was gonna be sent to Mexico, a country that I really don't even know other than visiting my family. Could I even handle, you know, going back to, to, to the country I was born and, and grew up as a child, but have never really made it my country because this is my country. Unicorn is unique in Kansas City and probably most of the Midwest. We produce shows that have never before been seen in Kansas City uh, and very often in the entire Midwest and sometimes anywhere in the world. I don't want to produce plays that are necessarily about the people who come to see the play. I want to shed light on a different group of people. I like people to walk into the theater and learn something completely new that they didn't know before they walked in. So everybody, we saw Hillary. Hi guys. Yay, we have Hillary back with us. <laughs> So yeah, this is so cool, and I just have to say, I think it's so cool that, as you well know, nobody gets to rehearse from the first day of rehearsal on the set. Mm -hmm. And here you have the set. I mean, you're going to get to know your space and your... It's always a, a nervous thing to start the first day of rehearsals. You, as a director, you do all the work you can ahead of time. You, I worked with the on the play for over a year now since first reading it um, and trying to prepare as best you can. The casting process here in Kansas City is sometimes 
a little trickier than it might be in New York. Very often when I pick a play and people say, oh, you can't cast that here, you know, I go, ha, pshaw. We will cast it here, we will find the actors, and we always find the actors. I think it's really important to help develop actors, and if you only do plays about middle-aged, middle-class white people, that's the actors who are gonna get the opportunity to excel. You have to go looking for playwrights. You have to go looking for stories, and you have to go looking for artists. Did you see these teardrops? See? Just another one last night. Beat him to death while he cried like a Elrilo is, uh, he's a tricky character. He's somebody who is kind of forced into a, a world that he doesn't, I don't think he fully understands. You have all this attitude, but no real nothing to back it up. I have the protection of the Bonnie Haiti. Do you think this comes from having no real nothing? Do you think I'm in a while? Little girl. Little tough beggar girl with holes in her dirty old shoes. I have the protection. Our first sit down, we went through my first scene. He has the mask completely on. He's fully machismo. He's very, you know, proud, cocky, everything that it means to be a man in this world. And it's like the complete opposite of who I am as a person. So I remember being very nervous about, you know, what is this playwright gonna think? You know, they cast me, this suburban kid who, you know, kind of Mexican. I mean, I am, but I don't speak Spanish. And you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's very different from my identity. I need a job. And what if I told you that's an old sign? Then what? There's always a way to make yourself useful. Always. What if I told you I want you to beg on your hands and knees while you lick my... This story for me is pretty close to home. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a Mexican-American, but my parents came here from Juarez. You know, I visited Juarez a lot when I was younger, but now, uh, in the past 10, 15 years, I haven't gone back. Um, because of the dangers. Um, my uncle, um, he was murdered himself, uh, gang-related violence. It's true. The violence is true. I guess trying to humanize Roberto Castillo is my greatest challenge. You hear me, Diablo? Strike me dead. It's easy to say that he's a corrupt police officer, um, but as the cards unfold, we see that there are so many players that are involved in the game that he is doing what is necessary, not just to advance as an officer, but to survive. It's a story that hasn't been spoken about in the volume that it needs to be heard at. Am I just standing or am I? I think you might stay kneeling. I'm not sure. So I, I've been sort of toying with the idea that maybe when Santa Marte is with you that you're lower than her. I think the thing that I was most excited about in reading this play the first time was seeing such strong female characters. Both Wanda and her daughter Raquel are put in um, unimaginable circumstances and they act with incredible bravery. And so much of her journey and her relationship with the Santa Muerte is about breaking down this wall of judgment and denial and the world being black and white. Mm -hmm. um, so like the more that you can find those moments, I think, at the top of the scene as opposed to the sadness and the begging. I mean, certainly that is there and you're desperate to find your daughter, but, but, but you're disgusted at yourself for even talking to this, this woman. My character, Raquel, is a 14-year-old girl, and she decides that she is going to become a prostitute in order to feed her family. And the drunks will scatter, and the putas will scream, and the monsters will run into the night searching for a ghost. And will disappear into the darkness. 
this play really empowers the female characters in a way that I have never seen. There is no apology for being a prostitute, right? Because it's a demand of the market. There is no need to um, victimize or infantilize or turn you know, into a poster child people that um, just by being people, they are granted full humanness. I grew up really yearning to see strong, fierce, unapologetic, courageous, no bullshit women. And I think that was became one of the big reasons why I seriously became a writer. Because I feel like these stories are not being told, but this world is populated with women that are like this. Where do they find me? Maybe soon. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe after your poems. Maybe never. This is a world that I was not familiar with. I've actually never been to Mexico, and I've never done this type of research for a play. So even just the dates of articles, so I open up articles that's talking about a recent um, murder or a group of women that have gone missing or um, any of the topics that we're talking about in the play, I'm shocked by how many there are, but also how frequent those come up. This is a current issue. We're not looking at a war that happened 40 years ago. We're looking at a constant um, current battle that women are facing. We all have naturalized the exploitation of um, women from the Global South as something that is there, and we cannot do anything. We have naturalized the exploitation of bodies, we have naturalized the exploitation of the environment, and we have naturalized the massive consumption of goods that are being produced. And we need to know about this. I think we all need to create conscience and decide that we have to do something. Let's go to the top of the scene. Yell at them when they ask for a napkin or mustard. I'll bite the inside of my mouth when I feel like yelling. I have a lot of scars. Shut up. La Santa Muerte um, represents the Holy Death. Um, she's a very important saint in Mexico, a saint that is not officially recognized by, by the Mexican church, but yet a saint that, that has um, a lot of influence in, in our communities. Usually when you think of a saint, you think of somebody who had been living and then through death kind of has uh, a title that is given to them. Santa Muerte has always been dead. She is the spirit of death. So we'll have to match the makeup to that mm -hmm. bone color. What particularly yeah, yeah. speaks yeah, yeah. to me in this play is, is having um, a deity um, that, that speaks to the needs of, of the working um, class people. This play provides a voice to those members of society in, in, in Mexico, in the border, that, that perhaps um, no one is listening to. I think that, that whole dynamic of the way human beings create the, the, um, the gods that they need for, for their situation is, is fascinating. And it's something that's been happening you know, since the beginning of humanity. And then your hair, your right. lovely hair. <laughs> the playwright for La Santa Muerte has chosen her to have three different robe colors, the purity of a white robe, um, the blood red robe, and the black robes of death. We also wanted her to look kind of sexy and street, and so she's wearing, you know, um, what you see in some imagery, um, a sort of corset and uh, ruffled skirt and um, boots. It's an interesting combination of, you know, sexy death. Well, the man in the black hat is rather a mysterious character. Um, he has his dark side, which I guess everybody in the play has, uh, but I think that more than anyone else, he has reconciled himself to that. Toro! Toro! Show the world your guts, little ball! I think the play is very much this, like, Greek Shakespearean tragedy. All of these people, every single character in this play is, is motivated by love. They love their families, they love their children, 
they, the, the, the two teenagers in the story fall in love with each other and through their falling in love are really able to have a new understanding of the world for the first time. A play on the page is really just a blueprint for building something in a live three-dimensional space. So it's really like everything you write is really theory until you have the opportunity to get it in a room with other people. And I love, 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 love being in a room with, with smart directors and smart actors who bring their own passion and their own talent and their own voice to the work. And then suddenly it, it becomes this really like magical experience when everybody is in sync building this thing together. So how are we set-wise? Yesterday um, we talked about adding six inches more to the yeah, back of the Yeah, I got that. It's on my list of to do today. Great. Cool. And then did you have anything else? Rachel didn't have anything else. I mean, right. we did talk today oh, about, yeah, we want to talk about that wall behind, wall L. What if it was just painted in, in a way that was sort of right. surreal and different? And we could spray it down. The place is very important to portray because it is the whole culture of this script. Um, this script could not really be set anywhere but this sort of Mexican-American border in Lote Bravo. I like that there are, that we see the interior of Wanda's home while we're seeing the exterior of the bar. Um, and the header is, is a very cool touch to sort of bring the hodgepodge pieces of the city and just wipe it across the whole stage. We're getting away from the very specific, literal kitchen play, um, where, you know, actors sitting around a table and talking about very sort of realistic subjects in a realistic way. Um, so I loved the heightened ability. You know, you have sort of the opportunity to make a big, big picture. Um, so you have to do it in a different way. Cuando amanezca otra vez, no más. I am really excited to see this play in real, live, three-dimensional space. I'm also anxious to see how audiences react to it because it's going to be a hard play to watch. It's a play that really questions some of our fundamental belief systems. It questions our lifestyle as Americans, our consumerism. I'm, I'm a little nervous about whether or not ultimately the audiences are gonna walk away with the same theme that I'm hoping to get across in the script, which is having compassion and empathy for people that are stuck in harrowing circumstances that really are created, have been created by the United States by our economic and corporate policies. I think there's a narrative that's already out there, that's been out there for a long time, that um, is not friendly, to put it mildly, to Latinos uh, and, and immigrants. And I hope that it, it uh, allows a different conversation to start on a national level. My family understands why they came to this country. I understand why they came to this country. But many people don't understand the struggles and, and how it is life or death for certain people. And the reason why they come here is to find a better life. This play is being translated in Spanish to really have a real international dialogue, I think it's imperative for people of both languages and both countries to be able to experience this story. <laughs>